Well, it is really a great, <clears throat> I just realized I'm going to be going, if I walk around too much, I'll be going in and out of the, uh, of the projector here. So I can't do that. Um, anyway, it is great to be here. Thank you for having me here, and thank you for coming on this snowy day. Much appreciated. I do want to give my special thanks to Deb Swoboda, who has made me feel incredibly welcome, and just it's great to chat with her, and wonderful to get the terrific directions for how to get here, which worked without a hitch. So everything is working well. It's, it's nice to be here. I, I really like your campus and uh, look forward to getting to know you a little bit better. There are going to be some opportunities for chatting a little bit with a neighbor and so at some point those of you that are sitting in some isolated place to join, join someone else because I will be asking you to process some ideas and thoughts about because after all it's about discussion right we have to have some we can't just have the presenter talking about discussion that makes no sense at all. Um, so here's a quick rundown of what I'm hoping we'll, uh, we'll cover today. Um, I am calling it dialogue in, uh, for part of this presentation. One of the reasons I'm doing that is there is something in the literature about the difference between dialogue, conversation, and discussion, which frankly, I mean, if you want to get into it, that's fine with me, but I'm not really that interested in it. But there, there are people who claim dialogue is the true exchange of ideas, the, the true opportunity for meaning to flow among different discussion participants. Whereas discussion is where people are trying to convince each other of their opinions and they're pounding in ideas and it's done in a, in a very uh, hostile almost and antagonistic way. And then conversation, some people say, is a very informal example of dialogue. Again, I, I don't really want to get into those distinctions, but I am using dialogue as the term here because it's talked about a lot by a couple of people I want to feature, William Isaacs and David Bohm, and we'll get to that in a minute. So we're going to talk about how dialogue helps learning, also how we prepare for dialogue, how to keep it going, and then some final thoughts, the, the four R's as uh, I describe them. I do need to tell you that uh, the reason I'm here, I guess, is as Deb said, I'm the co-author of Discussion as a Way of Teaching. We, we were actually in the second edition of our book that Stephen Brookfield and I put together. And the reason we wrote the book is not because we're such experts on discussion, but because we both love discussion and teaching. And we wanted to have an opportunity, an excuse, if you will, to find out more about it, to understand better how other people do it, to reflect a bit on how we do it, uh, to get a little bit better at it, though things always go awry, there are always problems, there are always difficulties. So I really, I, I'm, I don't come here as an expert so much as someone who is intensely interested in dialogue and discussion and conversation and education, and who sees it, and I make the assumption here, I see it as part of the heart of good teaching. Does that mean that all teaching should be discussion and dialogue and conversation? No, of course not. But I do question teaching that doesn't at least have a component of, of dialogue. So let's, uh, let's forge ahead and let's see. And by the way, feel free at any time to jump in with a question, with a thought, with a comment. This is meant to be as interactive as possible. We're a small group. We're in kind of a funny place in terms of interacting. But still, let's feel free to interact as much as possible. So let's talk about what dialogue. This is David Bohm, um, whom I'm told. Do we have any physicists in the room? Anyway, Bohm was quite an accomplished physicist, who, uh, theoretical physicist, who at the end of his life, near the end of his life, became very interested in the process of dialogue. And for him, dialogue and discussion are not times to solve problems. They're not even necessarily goal-oriented. But they are opportunities for a stream of meaning, as he put it, to flow among and through people. It's a time for people to bear their souls. It's a time for people to come together to express their thoughts and to listen to one another and give each person a, an opportunity to share a story or an idea or a feeling. And so for him, it's part of what it means to be human. It's part of what it means to develop oneself as a person. And I got to admit, 
I'm kind of taken with that notion of dialogue. So feel free to challenge it. This is Bill Isaacs, William Isaacs, who's also written some about dialogue. He's, a, he's somewhat more goal-oriented uh, than Bohm when it comes to discussion. And he says it's this shared inquiry, you know, where we, we think and we reflect together. And, we, and by doing it, we practice and we get better at it. And we get better at thinking and reflecting and even solving problems together that, as he says, leads to a totally new basis from which we think and act. So for Isaacs, discussion, conversation can transform us. It can help us to th see things in a whole new light. And I don't know if you've ever been in that kind of discussion where, well, you know, the floodgates opened up in some way, the light shined, you, you saw things that you had not seen before. Um, but I think that's, that's one of the things that Isaacs believes dialogue can be and has the potential to be. He also says it's a place to suspend our assumptions. So instead of necessarily being heavy-handed about our own points of view, we be open to other people's points of view. And to the extent that that's a good idea, it has implications for how we interact in discussion. So if we're not going to be intent on letting other people know about our point of view, we're going to be open, we're going to be listeners, we're going to be questioners to get more information, understand more deeply, and to be clear about what is being said. It's going to be more about what others have to share than what we have to share. Isaac also says it's a way of so, so we, we often talk about individuals being intelligent. We often talk about individuals being bright or smart, uh, being sharp, having wonderful ideas. Isaacs, and I'll admit, I, are interested in how groups are smart. How can discussion and coming together to explore ideas together help to make us smarter as a group? And, you know, in this era of the wisdom of crowds, part of the argument is that when groups work well together, they're almost invariably smarter than individuals. But of course, the working well together is part of the key. So I somewhat arbitrarily have said there are four qualities of effective dialogue. That it's disciplined, and by that, I mean it's focused. It's got boundaries. We're not constantly going off on tangents. Some tangents can be productive. But, but that there is a sense that we're talking about something together. We've come together to talk about something together, and we pretty much stick to that topic. And there's someone in the group, and maybe there are many someones in the group, who see it as their responsibility to help us stick to that topic, that subject matter, that thing we want to understand better. It's also thoughtful, as Isaac's already suggested. It gives us a chance to, to think together, to figure out where we stand together, to, to, hear, to hear what we believe about this, which further informs how we reflect on it, how we think about it. So we don't just hear each other, we also hear ourselves. And also we hear reactions to ourselves. All of that sharpens and deepens potentially our thinking. One of the key qualities of effective dialogue is it's participatory. It's, it's very hard to get everybody involved. We know that. Um, but over time, if it's a class, one of our goals as instructors, I think, ought to be to figure out ways to get everybody participating at least some of the time. To get everybody volunteering and adding to and contributing to this ongoing and increasingly deeper uh, and more profound conversation that we're having. And then it's connected and meaningful. Now, what do I mean by that? I think it's very important that discussion not just be about individuals expressing their point of view. It needs to build. It needs to take advantage of how I'm listening to you and what I'm hearing from you adds to what I'm thinking and feeling and that changes slightly what then I want to offer, 
which changes what someone else wants to contribute to the conversation. And as we listen to each other and as we acknowledge one another as contributors to our thinking, we start to create this sort of shared edifice of thought and of problem solving that is different from anything we could have done by ourselves. It's something that comes out of the, the interactions and, and the acknowledged interactions and, and the interactions that we carefully listen to as the dialogue proceeds. Very important that it be connected and thereby more meaningful for all of us. So let's talk about how dialogue can help learning. One of the things that's great about participation is we get a, a wider diversity of perspectives. I mean, one of the things we want from discussion, just like we want from reading, is to expand our experience. I mean, we can't experience everything, right? One of the reasons we read, one of the reasons we read fiction and nonfiction is to expand the realm of our experience. Well, dialogue is similar. We, part of the point is to go in thinking, I've got people I can learn from. There are people in this group that I can learn from. This isn't just about me offering up my ideas. This is a chance for me to hear this broad diversity of perspectives. It also encourages this questioning of assumptions. So again, we, we have certain assumptions about the world. We have certain beliefs. We hold back. As Isaac said, we suspend some of those assumptions to leave room for other points of view. You could argue other assumptions, depending on who's, who's in the group. But some of us, at least, are going to suspend some of those assumptions about what we believe for the sake of, of, of a better, more participatory, more diverse discussion. Dialogue at its best promotes close listening. I mean, this is going to come up again and again, and I, I don't think it surprises you at all that the best discussions are made up of attentive listeners. The best discussions are made up of attentive listeners who see it as being just as important to listen well as to speak well and clearly, who view it as just as essential that they hear what's being said as they express what they feel needs to be expressed. It's also a way to improve our communication skills, clearly. Discussion, the more we do it, the more we practice it, the better we can get at communicating our ideas, at hearing other people's ideas, at responding to those ideas in productive and helpful ways. All of that happens. So what else? Dialogue can also help us show respect for other people's voices and experiences. So let, let me unpack one of my assumptions for a second here and walk through this. I'm assuming, whether people tell you this or not, that they don't have enough chance to express their experiences, to express points of view, to talk about where they're coming from, to talk about what they're passionate about, to talk about what they care about, to talk about how the content is informing them, whatever it is, and that dialogue gives them that chance. We we thrive on that chance to have a place where we can express ourselves. And I'm assuming that one of the reasons we have to have discussion is to find that place where people can open up and, and talk about what they believe and what they're passionate about. And by showing respect for those viewpoints, by listening, by saying that this adds to my thinking, it adds a lot to the sense of community and the sense of validation that people need from dialogue. And then dialogue also helps habits of collaborative learning. I mean, we've already talked about that this is about collective thinking. This is about collective reasoning. This is about correct collective problem solving. It's also, it's also more than that. It's also about opportunities to, to feel together, to empathize together, to reach out to one another in some ways as well. So dialogue at its best is about thinking and about empathizing and expressing our concerns for one another, our commitments to one another. So it's got this, this sort of affective side as well as a cognitive side. All right, so that's an awful lot of stuff. So let me stop here and just see if you've got any comments or any questions or anything you want to you wanna say or add or disagree with, whatever you want. 
Yes. Do you think it's possible to have this kind of dialogue if you're, if you're, if what you're listening to, you're at odds with, I mean, you're vehemently opposed to what you're hearing? How, how, do, you, how do you work that? I, uh, part of me wants to say no. Because I know how upset I get when I hear a point of view that, it, that maybe even goes beyond my disagreeing with it that I view as hurtful, um, condescending, um, you know, literally racist, sexist, um, all of those things. So part of my answer is I think it's very difficult. But I think we've got to try. I think, I think for us to get to a place where we're more harmonious, more in agreement, can appreciate one another's differences, we've got to open up to listen. But your question does raise this fascinating issue of do we let overtly racist, dehumanizing, humiliating comments occur in discussion? And my sense is almost certainly not. Um, when, when we get to a place where we're humiliating each other, we've lost that sense of respect. When we get to that place where we're actively hurting one another, when there's reason to believe that we're actively hurting one another, I don't think we can hear each other anymore. So if it goes so far as to be humiliating and to bring, bring people down, um, then I think we have to stop. But I do think we have to find a way, short of those things, to be open to strong disagreements. Go ahead. Well, I have found that in my classes, which I try to run this way, it's almost 90% discussion, try to fit in content within the discussion. But when I hear something that I really disagree with, I find that much of the class, or at least some of the class, also disagrees with it as well. And I try not to come down in a way that shows my disagreement, but I encourage other people to participate, and I usually get from them the same arguments that I want to make. And, you know, in the beginning, we make sure that everything is civil, and we're not hurting each other. But most of the points that I want to make are made by other students as well. So I just give them the opportunity to do that, and um, that seems to work. Do you mind if I just take a moment to, to sort of underscore what you're saying? Um, it's worth reflecting on your own teaching to think about how often what you wanted to add to discussion gets mentioned or brought up by another student anyway. And my feeling is I'd rather have the students have the chance to express it rather than me as the instructor. I think it has more power. It has more of an impact. It has more of an influence on others. So think about that for your own teaching. Are there times when you're about to say something but you hesitate because you're thinking, I th this may come from the group and I need it to come from the group. I, I just think it's a fascinating comment that you're making. And, and to the extent that it can come from the group, that it can be a contribution from other students, I think we need to find a way to make way for that. So, you know, how, being aware of that uh, being respectful of that, I think, is hugely important. Well, let's keep going, but um, we'll, we'll keep talking, too. Um, so the argument here is that one of the ways we prepare for dialogue is um, how we talk with our students. Let me just put these all up here. When we lecture, or when we're not in discussion mode. We can prepare the students for discussion by trying to model these things, by framing our own comments as inquiry. How often do we share content that we make it sound like it's totally settled? We already know that this is the case. And how often is it true that in fact it isn't totally settled that it's still, there's still contention within the field, there's still disagreement, there's still uncertainty about whether it's true. How often do we allow that uncertainty, that contention, that disagreement to seep into our own comments? So we don't have to do that all the time, but one of the ways to get ready for dialogue, which is after all this opportunity to share lots of different points of view, is in our own lectures 
to, to view this as an ongoing inquiry, not something that's decided on, not something that's definitive. Another way is we can close with our own questions about the content. Here are some things I continue to be unsure about, despite what we've talked about today, despite what I've lectured about today. Here are some ongoing questions that I have that I don't think have been satisfactorily answered. Do we include periods of silence? I think in discussion and in lecture, we need more opportunity for people just to think together. And sometimes they need the silence to do it. And silence, silence communicates the idea that this is a place for thinking as well as sharing ideas. And we could do the same thing in a lecture, that, that we're actually spending time thinking about what we're saying or about what we're about to say or, or finding a need to say it differently at a particular point in time and that we need a little bit of extra time to find the words to express it well. And then this idea of introducing alternative views. So here's the content, here's the point of view I presented. I want you to know, though, that there's another set of point of views on this that are in pretty strong disagreement with what I've said. Take that into account, understand where they're coming from, how they've been documented. Maybe I think my point of view is, is better supported, better documented in the literature than this other point of view, but, and here's why. But nevertheless, please take into account that there are other views. So we're, we're lecturing, but in a dialogic mode, in a way that's open to questions, in a way that's open to disagreement, in a way that's open to thinking through, uh, uh, and, and in a way to considering alternative points of view. We allow for assumption hunting as well, of course. So, preparing for dialogue. Some people think that we, it's a good idea to establish, yes, go ahead. Before you move on, you said assumption hunting, of course, but I'm not sure I know what you mean. Okay, all right. Um, I, I just mentioned it a couple of other times. So, the assumptions that we bring to the things that we teach, to the content, um, our beliefs, that we are open to questioning those assumptions, that we're open to, sometimes we don't even know what our assumptions are, so that we're open to thinking about what are our assumptions about this content, what are our assumptions about these ideas that we're trying to express, and are, are, first, are we, can we locate them, and then are we willing to question them and subject them to some interrogation of, of some kind. So that's, again, that's this idea that we're, we're open to different points of view, and that's, that's the power of, one of the powers of dialogue is that lots of diverse points of view get expressed. So preparing for dialogue, um, some people think it's a good idea to establish ground rules. And let me give you an example of a set of ground rules. I will read the text carefully. I will listen to what others say. I will not interrupt the person speaking. I will speak clearly. I will give others my respect. So just one of many sets of ground rules that you could put forward, that you could suggest for how we're going to discuss things together. But another way to come up with dialogue, with ground rules, is to think about these questions. What's the best dialogue you've ever been in? What's the worst? What made the good ones work well? What can we concretely do to create better dialogues in the future? So what I want you to think about and talk with a partner or a couple people. What's some of the best dialogues and what are some of the worst dialogues you've ever been in? And see if you can identify, not, not six or seven, one or two things that made those dialogues work or one or two things that caused those dialogues to fall flat, to not go anywhere, to not be stimulating or helpful to anyone. So take a few minutes. What's the best dialogue you've been in? What's the worst? And what are one, two, one or two things that contributed to those good dialogues? One or two things that prevented the dialogue from, from going on anywhere. So chat a little bit and let's come back together.
Let's see where we are, and then we're going to come back to these little, these little sharings in a minute, too, I think. Um, so let's, let's, let's try worst. Worst dialogue. What was it like? What caused it to happen? What were some things that were said? Anybody? Give us an example. Go ahead. Um, Bernie said maybe um, people are um, different 
levels and there's a hierarchy. Uh -huh. Sometimes, even though the, the notification or the invitation says this is about a discussion, it's actually not about a discussion. Okay. So false discussion, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Disguised, a lecture disguised as a discussion, or a top down report disguised as a discussion. What's another example? Anybody? Go ahead. I was in a situation where I didn't really have an opportunity to give feedback on my own point of view. Okay. So I was basically told what my point of view is. Huh? How did that feel? Oh. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Did you have a sense of why that was? Why did no one participate? Um, I, I think partially, I think, is some students, they just don't want to participate. I mean, for whatever the reason, they don't. But on the other hand, I, I think probably as the faculty member, maybe also should try to how to formulate the question better or give them some try to encourage in some way to facilitate better those type of things. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. These are all. Go ahead. On the flip side, um, we were talking about how you know, sometimes you might have these shy people in class, but if you open up a, like an online discussion, you might see that they are not shy anymore and very, very vocal. So. How many people have had that experience of online discussion? The, the ones who weren't very vocal become vocal. Anybody else? Because yeah, I've had that. I mean, experience too. I mean, it's just amazing to me what what you're saying because it can be so striking. Go ahead. Sometimes the discussion goes the direction that you don't want it to go. <laughs> so it's difficult to pull it back. It means they were already interested so much. Yeah. Uh, now, I I can't resist asking you though. So for the instructor, that's uncomfortable. Was it uncomfortable for the participants too, do you think? Or did they like it going they, in this they other? They like it going. <laughs> so it's hard for me to, you know, you see they are so enthusiastic in discussing this, these questions, but not really when, you know, going from the direction that they want to go. So I think it's a little bit easier for them to discuss. Okay. So the old wandering discussion right, is, right, a, right. is a problem. Or you could all bring out the cl some of the classic Problems with discussion. Go ahead. Yeah, just uh, I mean the same situation that Shodan is mentioning, but where the students. I mean, it's not uncommon for a student to answer the question. Um, it's not related. It's not relevant. It's it's not right. And I find that the students in my situation, that the students do get much more irritated than I am. I don't have a problem with people try, and I generally encourage people to say what I say that no stupid answers. And right. that's really my, nothing wrong. It's better to try to practice your thinking. But I find that the other students kind of almost look to me for help me, uh, rescue me. So and <laughs> then I feel that there are the two, that the conflict, that I hate to help people for what they are doing because I encourage them to do that, but then I have to protect the rest of the class. So those are great points. Do you think there's a difference between there being no stupid answer and there being no irrelevant answer? I mean, can, it, can something be not stupid but not at all on point and therefore problematic? That, or? That, uh, yes, that's true, but I mean, if you want to encourage people to talk, you have to take chances that they will say all kinds of things. Okay. And I think that that's a good thing to happen. Yeah. And then you can start ah. worrying about the content. All right, yeah. fair enough. Yes, please. Last night in my class, we had a discussion. The class had a discussion. Well, I gave them a case study, and then there was a discussion following that. And um, uh, the issue was that you know, this person was coming to work late, and so what would you do about it using a particular uh, leadership theory? But one person, of course, said, um, fire her. So, <laughs> uh, you know, there was someone else in the class who chimed in to say, well, that would not be the first step. And it so happened that that particular person I happen to, is, I know is a union delegate. So she then, <laughs> you know, came into the, the discussion. So it, it, it um, 
Sounds good. <laughs> You're going to find that the students may say things that are not what you really want them to say, but at the same time, they can learn from it because this then led to another discussion about, um, you know, how we deal with employees um, in terms of uh, disciplining employees, which I said to them we would discuss at a later time in the course. Huh? But at least, you know, it brought out that, that the student could make that correction. Do you have any sense of where the student was at the end of the discussion who said fire? Of course, yeah. yes. He, he, said it, well, he said, well, he agreed with her in the end because we, we went back to the, the theory, that the leadership theory that was being discussed to say, how would you deal with this person? And that there was another way to deal with it using, you know, just talking to the employee first and you know, finding out what they were doing. So you know, the discussion ensued around that and so. You must feel very good about that discussion. <laughs> As I mean, it's great when that, when that happens, when they begin with a, in a certain place and then end up in a, maybe a more constructive and very interesting. Boy, okay, so what about good discussions? Uh, what do they look like? in your experience and what makes them good? What, what's the thing that tips the balance? Um, at times, good discussion, uh, the topic is of interest. You know, it's stimulating and you can bring something to the table as well. You know, it's not something that's totally foreign to you. Okay, great. Um, and also, everyone is pretty much on the same page. They're opening to listening. Uh, you can give your point of views and, you know, you can share your thoughts and feelings about a particular topic and everyone could listen and also there's also respect throughout the discussion. Wow. So let's just take a moment to linger over what you've just said there. So everybody can relate to the subject matter. They can sort of see themselves connected to that subject matter in terms of their experience. Um, no one is, has a lot more knowledge than anyone else. They're roughly equal in terms sometimes, of their experience and knowledge. Sometimes one person might know a little bit more than others, but it's good to listen to that person because you can potentially learn something in the right. process as well. There's respect. What, is it, what does that mean to you when people are respecting each other? Well, first it should be, you, you know, you're not condescending as you mentioned earlier. Uh, you listen to someone's point of view, whether you agree or disagree with it, you do it in a respectful manner. Um, in addition, you also listen when the person is speaking. You know, you don't talk over them and just pretty much it's a good discussion. And no foul language. Yeah, no foul language. <laughs> if possible. Well, that just rules out a whole bunch of discussions that I've been a part of. Uh, so what else? What, what's another good discussion you've been a part of, and what do you think? A, a, a large proportion of the people in the room haven't already decided what they think about the topic. Could you say that again? Would you mind just saying that again? A large proportion of the people in the room haven't already decided what they think about the topic. That one really hits me as being important, that we haven't all figured out what we believe. And that maybe the discussion will help to shape our thoughts a little bit about it. Other examples, good discussions that you've been in, when you have your image of one of your better discussions, what's going on, what's happening, what does it look like, yes? I think maybe when people are able to demonstrate that they've heard what was said, either by reflecting back some of it or by taking off from that point to something else. Everybody get that? As opposed to just saying, oh, well, I did this. Right. So we're really building on each other's ideas. We're really hearing each other's ideas. We're using each other's ideas. Terrific. Well, there's a lot more to be said about this, about um, good discussions and what, make, what brings them to that point. But let's, let's keep going. Um, oh, well, no, 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 one more thing. So given what we've talked about and things we haven't talked about, what would be two ground rules you'd want to have that would be part of a setting where there's discussion? Maybe you're the facilitator, maybe you're not. What would be two ground rules, and if you can't stick to two, that's okay, but just two basic ground rules that you think everybody should follow to make discussions work well so they're closer to best than to worst. Yeah? Um, and when we're talking about scientific debates, yeah. I always tell my students that science is emotionless, even though we have an emotional connection to 
uh, the topics we're talking about. Tell me the emotions outside. Okay. Okay. So, and, and to leave the emotions outside means to not get angry. Yes. Um, is it okay to laugh? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. No, no, seriously. I really want to understand what it means to leave the emotions outside. So crying is probably not okay. No, but I mean, if someone's going to uh, you know, refute based on anger, okay. based on a past experience, um, then we're not, we're not going anywhere. Okay. So a big part of it's about anger, yeah, I think, right? Science, yeah. you know, there's all these outliers, and, and it seems like all the outliers are in our classrooms, but uh, they're, they're, they're not the 95 percent that are. Okay. Good. Yes. Oh, I'm just wondering what uh, he's saying is like objective. Like you, you talk about this thing, it's not like it's always personalized. I, I don't know exactly the word, but it's, it's not subjective. It's it's not from our personal point of view, and we don't need to ha have personal differences over the. I mean, it, some some content we can't help but have that. But with science content, for instance, and lots of other content too, we just keep our our personal feelings more or less out of it. That's a little bit tricky, but but yeah, I think I think you I think yeah, that's helpful. That it's more about the objective than the subjective. It's. It's really the content that's driving the discussion, as opposed to the individual subjectivities of the participants. Go ahead. I mean, okay. yeah. just kind of in response to, uh, to Sean, uh, I, sometimes I find that even if we talk, and I teach a lot of research methods, so I mean, it's true, it has to, there has to be some objectivity. Um, but I find many times that the student gets the more involved when there is something like there is a past experience. Like if I will say something about some kind of a statement, knowledge statement, and I just remember one student wrote the whole thing of, I mean, the sexual activity of his grandfather, showing kind of, and then the whole class, you know, it was like kind of a great, uh, you know, statement. How, how could it not be? Right? Yeah. yeah, so, um, so and, and that's really made it discussion which was even about another thing, it was about scientific observation and all of that, much more um, lively and people were more, so I sometimes I feel that, and I don't know, but I don't have, I always say I don't have experience with other academic institutions and I'm sure that there is also difference in student populations, the way how you teach them, but I find that with our student, experience, life experiences are very important because sometimes they are not equipped so much with knowledge experience. So I, I think that it's a great way. So, I mean, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, some inappropriate sure. uh, behaviors, but I find that it's, I sometimes wish I will have more good kind of experiences to, to, view, to use in class rather than I talk about knowledge. And sure. that's when everybody falls asleep. And there's no reason why life, our life experiences can't come into it without a lot of emotion around it, too. There isn't necessarily a, a contradiction there. By the way, though, this discussion does bring up an issue about when discussion is most appropriate. And I, I, of course I can't give a definitive answer on this, but I think discussion is better when the subject matter is not already settled. I think you're better off lecturing if we know what the answers are, if we know already where we stand on this, and you're simply trying to impart some knowledge to students. So let's not get into this mindset that, gosh, I've got to have some discussion in this class, even though it doesn't really fit what I'm trying to teach. Discussion is best for when there is still disagreement, where things are still open-ended, where personal experience does come into play in, a, in, a, in an important way. If there's something you're trying to get across and you're using discussion to draw it out of the students, my advice would be just lecture. You're much better off. Go ahead. I'm not so sure this is about the grand rule or not, but I find it's very crucial to uh, form the questions. In other words, the good questions. On the one hand, that the question should be designed that related to everyone's experience so they can have something to talk. But on the other hand, the question cannot be just to stick on your personal experience. Experience has to be, you know, target out some serious issue. Sure. So it's always a difficult. So how do we combine? I mean, that's a great. It's almost like a ground rule. How do we ask questions that honors the content, 
but also takes into account our personal experience in some way. It's a, it's, I mean, that doesn't solve it for us. It's still a challenge to do that, but I think it's a great point. Um, and I think good discussion leaders and questioners try to take into account both of those. Maybe you can't do it in a single question. Maybe you have to start with what's your experience around this and then leap to here's what we know about this. How does that connect back to your experience in some way? Well, let's keep going. And uh, these are great, wonderful comments. Um, so I want to, want to share with you just some quick thoughts about the five L's of discussion. That's why there's a pentagon here. There are five of them. Um, we have listening. And we've already talked about listening quite a bit as one of the things that's at the heart of good discussion. We have looking. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, we have lingering, kind of slowing down a little bit, not trying to rush through. Some people's experience in discussion is that it's all going by too quickly and there isn't a way to make a contribution. There's a role for leading and there's a role for letting go. So this is about all of you and when you lead discussion. These are five L's worth keeping in mind. So let's talk about them a little. Um, some of the things we listen for. We listen for what students are actually saying this has come up already, for how they are building on or adding to what others have said. So, and how do we encourage that? How do we model that? An interesting comment was made over here about this. Now you're bringing up a similar comment. Do you notice the similarities between the two comments or how one is building on the other? How do we, how do we draw attention to when students are building on one another's comments? And we listen for is there a sense of increasing shared understanding? Is there a sense that people are coming to appreciate something here that we can all agree on, that we can all reach a kind of consensus on? Or if not a consensus, a shared meaning that comes from acceptance of differences as well as um, acceptance of, of where we stand on a particular issue. So those are just some of the things that we're listening for. Um, but it's key. It's absolutely key to, to discussion and a certain amount of active listening where we try to acknowledge what we've heard or we paraphrase what we've heard or we express appreciation for what we've heard because it's added so much to the conversation is also part of this listening process. How do you know good listeners? How can you tell someone, we talked about this a little bit already, but what does a good listener look like? They what? Nod they nod a lot? Okay. Sometimes. <laughs> verbal and nonverbal cues. Tell us more about what those are, okay? Reflecting, uh, just make sure that the speaker knows that you're Eye contact, you know. body language. Tell us a little bit about the body language, but well, tell us. Like a, listening, 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 listening. Okay. So you don't want them to get too close to you, though, also, because they're invading your. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We don't want anything invading the personal, that's right. So it's sort of like a, it's also a cultural variation to that too. It is, and, and eye contact, yeah. you're right. Just be careful and know the population. That's right, great point. And, and that's also, just think about what you said in terms of listening to who you're working with. So you're, you're listening in the sense that you're taking it all into account and figuring out what are appropriate responses. So you're really attending, you're really paying attention to what's going on. And that affects how you can most productively respond. Very powerful set of ideas about listening. So we look, um, you know, we just were talking about this, right? For body language, eye contact, facial movements. Um, again, we have to be careful about the cultural differences there. Uh, we look, and here's a, a huge one for me. So I, I, probably some of you do this too. If I have a student directing all the comments to me, I'll look to everybody else. So I'm trying to encourage, and sometimes I'll just say, please direct your comments to everyone else, but I'm trying to encourage this to be a truly shared space. And if this is just about students responding to the instructor, then it becomes a, a two-way thing rather than a multi-way. So that's part of what we're looking for. And we're also trying to find, you know, as, as we said, the body language, 
Other signs of engagement, I mean, are they listening? Are there signs they're listening in terms of that they, they can uh, paraphrase what they've just heard, how they're building on what they heard, um, how distanced are they? Later on, we're going to talk about the critical incident questionnaire, which is a way of finding out how engaged or distanced were students during the class and gives you some clues about how you might change things so that they're more engaged. So we did listening and we've done looking of the five L's. The third L is lingering. I really encourage you to try this sometime if you haven't already. If you're in one of those discussions that's rushing along and it's kind of exciting, but it's also a, a little bit bewildering, call a halt and say, I need time to think. I need time to, to, to take in all that's been said. I need time to process and reflect on what I've heard. Now, it does a couple of things. One, it literally slows the discussion down and does give people a chance to, you know, just stop. Another is it shows respect for what's being heard. It really is a way of saying, there's, there's so many great comments coming out here, I can't keep track of them all. I need time to take some notes. I need time to think about what I've heard. But it also might give room to that person who wants to get into the conversation and hasn't been able to find a way. And so when you start the discussion again, part of your responsibility is to look very carefully at eyes. I mean, some of you may, I, I am not in favor of calling on people involuntarily. I mean, this, this is an ongoing debate. We can even talk about it if you want in discussion and dialogue. I'm not comfortable doing it. I like to bring people in who I think really are ready to share. But occasionally, people are ready to share who aren't raising their hands. And so you've got to look for the, at their eyes. You've got to look at their body language. You've got to look at that hand that's only, you know, just a little bit up. Um, and for other things, too, that indicate that this is a person who wants to jump in. I think it's very important that we find room for the non-participators. And, and, and please don't assume non-participators are apathetic or bored or disconnected. They may be a little bit shy. They also may not be quite as aggressive as some others. And it's hard for them to find a way into the conversation. We're going to talk more, by the way, about how to bring those folks in. But one of those ways is by lingering. Um, this, this is the classic issue of wait time. Um, those of us in the education biz are particularly familiar with the wait time literature. Who, anybody know about wait time stuff? We have any wait time advocates here? What, do you, you want to just tell us what? Exactly. Exactly. Apparently, teachers typically will give students two seconds to respond. And then they answer. And they answer themselves. Because that's another strategy teachers use. If, if the student isn't going to answer, then they answer for them. Right. And then they answer to alleviate them being uncomfortable instead of waiting. Right. So part of, part of our challenge is to get rid of the discomfort with silence in the classroom. Get rid of it. Throw it out. You know, if I were one of, those, one of those discussion leaders with a fancy game to play, I'd have you write down silence, put, you know, roll it up into a ball and throw it in the waste paper basket. I mean, it's, you've, got to be, you've got to accept that there's going to be some silence if people are, are thinking and people are, are really trying to process their thoughts together. So we need to give more time. I, I think I'm, I'm an advocate of waiting 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 50 seconds for people to respond. Go ahead. I think also, you know, as teachers, we also have to be comfortable with the noise, with the, with the talking. True. Um, because if there is discussion and there is dialogue and there are all these voices, you know, an administrator might walk in and think it's chaos or what's going on here. So not only do we have to be comfortable with the quiet, we also have to be comfortable with the, the sound, the, 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 the talking of it. You know, I know I tell a particular patient, I tell if I walk into a second grade class and it's quiet, I'm worried. <laughs> it shouldn't be quiet. It, this should be active engagement. But No, it's a great, that's a great point. I think you're right. We need to be comfortable with both. Um, 
Let me just mention this now. because It'll come up again, but I think it's important enough. One of the things that Stephen Brookfield and I have really advocated is using the circle of voices. Tech, it's what we call it, but it's been called many things, sometimes the talking stick. Um, and that is, there are times in class when we want everybody to participate. We want to hear from everybody, virtually without exception. And we simply set up a situation where we're going to ask a question or bring up a topic and say that we're going to go around the circle. Each person gets a chance to respond to the question or the issue without interruption from anyone else. And we're also not going to comment on those, on those contributions until everyone has a chance to speak. So it can't be done in a large class, but in a class of 15, say, we can go around the circle, maybe 20, we can go around the circle, hear what everyone has to say, and then open up conversation by picking up on not our own comment, but what someone else said as we went around the circle. Invariably, invariably, you will hear from people in the class whom you haven't heard from before with some profound insight to share. Go ahead. Well, yeah, you pretty much have to say you have a minute. So you don't, you don't let them talk and talk. Part of the ground rule, and I should have explained this. Right, you've got a minute to say what you want to say, and then we're going to move on to the next person. First time around, we usually have everybody speaking. But certainly by the second or third, everyone is speaking. And so I would ask you to think about what that means. So if you create a situation where everyone can speak, and everyone does, doesn't that say something about the desire to express oneself in a classroom? Um, now, you could argue that there's a kind of peer pressure, there's a kind of cultural pressure to speak, but I really don't think that's it. I think it goes back to this, this under-exercised opportunity to say something in a group, to express an opinion, to give a perspective um, that, we just, that people just don't get enough of and that classrooms are a wonderful opportunity to build that kind of community. Go ahead. Um, I did that recently in my education course, a class that I'm teaching, and uh, we were talking about families, so I asked the students to define what, you know, family is, and to talk a little bit about their family. And a lot of, you know, I have a few students who are very white. They just don't participate, and pretty much they said, they spoke about their family, they defined it, you know, however, you know, fam what their definition was of a family, and it actually worked. Yeah. So everyone got involved and, you yeah. know, just started an open discussion. That's wonderful. Another variation on this that I'm sure many of you know of is to get into small groups and do something similar um, to, to do the circle of voices with just a group of five or six and then bring back some of the comments that were said in those small groups. So it can be done with the small group and the large group. So leading. Um, there is a need for discussion leaders to lead, uh, as we've already said, by modeling, uh, by exemplifying a way of asking questions, by role modeling a way of listening, uh, by also helping, I mean, think about, those, think about those qualities of good discussion. In order for discussion to be disciplined, to be focused, to have boundaries, we need a leader to keep us on task. We do need someone to say, you know, we're a little bit off the topic now, can we get back over here, so the leading is important here. It is part of facilitating thoughtful, participatory, disciplined, meaningful conversation. All of those qualities that we mentioned earlier can be facilitated by, by the leader in discussion. Um, the, dis the discussion leader also needs to build on and recognize helpful contributions that were made to the conversation too. But this is by way of everything that the leader is doing, everything, almost without exception, the discussion participants <coughs> excuse me, should be coming to do as well. So everything you role model as a leader, maintaining that discipline, getting people participating, listening, responding respectfully, um, communicating clearly, building on what others have said, and so many others. All of those things you want participants to do too. And so one way of judging whether discussion 
is really growing, whether discussion is really moving in a productive direction, is are the participants in general adopting a lot of the same habits that you have tried to um, display yourself and model yourself as the discussion leader. So keep that in mind. Those things can actually be measured with relative ease. You know, how much participation do we have? How much do we, do we have people giving feedback to each other? How much do we hear people recognizing each other? How much are they building on one another's comments? Uh, what's the quality of the listening that's going on? How well are they paraphrasing? I mean, you can go on and on with the sorts of behaviors. And, and I will go on and on when we get to something called conversational moves. Letting go, um, in a sense, I just mentioned letting go because this is the idea um, that we need to let the participants take over. I mean, it goes back to your, your wonderful comment from earlier that so often the things that I was going to say would come from the group anyway. Um, how, do we, how do we open things up so those comments that would come from the group, in fact, come from the group? Um, in addition, though, I do think discussion leaders make a huge mistake by asking questions they already know the answers to. I am not a proponent, and I'm willing to hear dis disagreement on this, I am not a proponent of asking questions that are factual questions that you're simply trying to draw out through recitation. That's not really discussion, it's recitation. Um, so let's call it what it is, um, or if you've got an answer in your mind, that you're trying to get the students to fish for. Oh, no, that's not it. That's not it. Again, not really discussion. That's just trying to figure out what's in the teacher's mind. I mean, it, it may be important what's in the teacher's mind, but my argument would be, why have them fish for it? Why not just share what that is? So leave, leave room for discussion for that, those really meaningful exchanges about our personal experiences, about how we feel about the content, about the disagreements that are in the field, all of those things. And, um, and as I've said, we're, the idea is eventually for the students to be taking the lead. Um, you, know, you mentioned leadership theories. One of my favorite leadership theories is this idea that we're trying to create a situation where the leader doesn't have to lead anymore. It's everybody else who does the leading. Um, so we, we role model, we, we demonstrate, and over time, the group is leading as much as the leader is leading. Same idea with discussion. Go ahead. I'd like to get back to what you said about if you had an answer in your mind and you're leaving it up to the class to kind of fish, you have to know what it was fish for. I'm guilty of that. Okay. And but I, what I have found is that uh, when I get answers that that are not not the answer that I'm looking for, uh -huh. but some answers that I get from the students are also right. And I get a chance to learn from those responses. And I think that helps the other students because I admit that I hadn't thought of that, but that's a good answer. And that helps with the discussion because I'm also learning with them. And one of the things that I've tried to tell them is that I want to learn from them as much as you learn from me or from you learning from each other, I think that is helpful. I'm with you. I, uh, as soon as you say that they end up saying things that you hadn't expected, that maybe in some ways are just as right as what you were expecting, you've changed the dynamic completely. So if it's not about just guessing what's in your head, but about being able to express other ideas that you hadn't anticipated, a whole different world. But I would still contend, and, and maybe we need to talk about this for a minute, that it's not particularly productive for the students simply to recall some factual thing that you're asking them about and there's only one answer. Why not? You know, I mean, you, we can do it, but I, I guess I wouldn't call that discussion in the manner that we've been talking about it. It isn't a way to enhance our thinking or to sharpen our communication skills. It really is just an exercise in recall then. So, so but I'm willing to hear other other different, other viewpoints on that. Yeah, go ahead. One of the humbling moments for me in a recent lecture was, was hearing the students say, I don't know if this is what you're looking for. Yeah. And I'm right, right away, I was like, the morning, I was like, uh-oh. And, and I felt that totally, 
not the way I had intended. Yeah, that's a great example. Go ahead. I mean, I generally agree with what you said about fishing, but I, I think that, that there's also a value in what you might call warm-up, uh, especially at the beginning of the class, that, that, that the, 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 getting them to say the first word, even if it's, it, and, and making it a safe word, you know, like where, you know, where, where everybody knows, you know, you know what, what, the, what this really simple thing is, and then even the more timid students may say, may, may give you that. Uh, and then they may feel more empowered to talk later. It's a great, it's a great reason for doing it that way. Yeah, I, I love that idea of a warm up. Or, I mean, another way to put that is to ask a question. And this is somewhat different, but still, to ask a question that that everybody, from their experience, has an answer to, that everybody feels relatively comfortable providing an answer to, which gives them a chance simply to participate. It gives them simply a chance to say something in a public forum and to begin to get used to saying things in public forums and to be somewhat less embarrassed or somewhat less self-conscious about it. So I agree with you. Any technique to get people talking and feeling a little bit more comfortable talking in a public place is very much in, in keeping with the, the kinds of skills we're trying to promote. Go ahead. Um, I, you know, the only answer, I, you're absolutely right, by the way. I mean, clearly, this can go back to Socrates. There are, there's a whole string of Greeks, in fact, who promoted discussion and dialogue, and in some ways even did it better than um, Socrates, or Socrates as portrayed by Plato. Um, I guess they were, at, they were people I was reading. Um, who have been very influential recently in work on dialogue. Um, and I thought maybe folks could just relate to them more. Um, but you're right. I, I could have gone back to the very beginning of recorded time to talk well, about this. I do, I mean, I, I do think, I mean, Bohm would not be one of those people, but I think someone like Isaacs is much more systematic about what it looks like for dialogue to work well. So this idea that we need to suspend assumptions, this idea that we need to spend time listening, this idea that we need to figure out how to think together collectively and solve problems together and to have practice solving problems together collectively. I mean, those things and so many others, this, uh, the idea that we're building on one another's ideas that we're not just in, in this individualistically. Um, many of those things, um, and I'm not saying some of the earlier people didn't talk about these too, but I think they, people like the Isaacs and so many of the others who've written about dialogue recently, um, have given us a, a, somewhat, a somewhat clearer topology maybe of what dialogue looks like and, and discussion looks like when it's working well. Um, but I, your point is very well taken, yeah. State and when I teach, um, I'm very new to teaching. I never went to college or anything before. But counselors are required to teach student development, which is a success in college course. So probably newer teachers do ask a lot of things that I know the answers to. Um, but I find they're not doing the assignment. Right. Like they have no idea of anything that resembles what's in the text. Or yeah. Well, uh, I mean, a couple things about that. I mean, one is there's no reason why you can't do that. But I wouldn't suggest that it's discussion or dialogue. Two, you could give a quiz, which would perhaps have the same function as finding out whether, maybe a, even a more efficient function of finding out whether they're doing the reading or not, or at least getting the factual material from the reading. You could, uh, you could give a lecture, but that isn't going to be a, uh, an indicator of whether they've done the reading or not. Um, you could have them in a small group discussion, 
talk about some of the reading, but m not just have the discussion, also answer some prepared questions mm -hmm. that you've developed that are partly um, based on just factual content and partly based on building on that factual content. I just, the reason I bring it up, I think, is that the whole notion of recitation, of asking questions and getting factual answers and respond is way overdone, I think. I think it becomes the way that too many instructors um, use discussion. And I want it to go beyond that. I, uh, I, I don't want it just to stop there, I guess you could say. Um, OK, so <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of this is Socrates, uh, Greek models, uh, questioning to keep dialogue going. So I'm a big believer in asking very specific questions to keep uh, discussion going. Um, discussions that ask people to clarify what they're saying. Questions that ask people to link what they're saying to what other people have said or to readings that they've done. Um, questions that ask them for more evidence. How do you know that? So what I'm going to show here are some of those questions and some examples of those questions. So questions for evidence. Um, in order for discussion to get deeper, in order for discussion to go somewhere, we do need to start asking each other, how do you know that? So it's not just that you, know, you have a right to put an idea out there. Where did that come from? Um, what's the basis for it? And I think that's part of a, of a process of developing our critical thinking in dialogue. Another way to put it, another way you might say, what data is that claim based on? Uh, what does the author su say that supports your argument? So this might be a text-based discussion where you're asking students to go to the text. Uh, where did you find that view expressed in the text? Uh, what evidence would you give to someone who doubted your own interpretation? So it's not just that you have a point of view or an interpretation. It also comes from somewhere. Let's spend some time talking about where it comes from. Instructors have that responsibility. Students have that responsibility, too. So again, this is a way of sharpening discussion, a way of getting students to go a little bit deeper, a, a way of getting students used to using critical thinking, and in a democratic society, maybe in particular, um, and in, a, in one that relies so heavily on science, we want students to be able to talk about the evidence that is available to them that supports their beliefs. So other kinds of questions. Questioning for clarification. Um, I think too often we let students say things and we don't understand what they've said. Or we don't understand where they're coming from. Or we can't make it out and we let it go. I want to make an argue for lingering with students a little bit longer. I didn't quite get that. Can you put that another way? Uh, what's a good example about what you're talking about? What do you mean by that? Very simple, straightforward kind of question. Can you explain the term you just used? So we all have a tendency to use jargon, and our students get very used to jargon as well. Do we take the time, if we haven't already gone over it, to get them to explain um, what that term is all about? Um, and you know, can you give another illustration of the point that you made? So this, this builds on the evidence idea suggests that students have an obligation. This is also about practicing these skills. They have an obligation to be clear. Just as we have an obligation to be clear, we're holding them accountable, we're saying, for demonstrating that clarity. Go ahead. I think that's a very good point, because a lot of my students try to speak with sentences with, that are made up of one or two words. And that'll just finish by saying, you know what I mean? Yeah, right. And so they're not clear. And all too often, people are willing to let that go. And I think we really do have to make them speak in full sentences. Yeah. Or, or at the very least, when we don't know what they've just said, that they take the responsibility for expressing in a way that is clear, both to us and just think of all the students in the class who probably aren't able to place what's been said. Yeah, go ahead. I think we also need to teach our students how to ask these questions. Yeah, great, exactly. So that they can say to, to another student in the class, well, what do you mean by that? Right. I mean, you know, give another example. That is, that's, yeah. It's hard to be 
it, it is hard, but, but I think we can do it. I really do think we can do this. If, if we are in the habit of it and if we encourage it and, and try to set up situations where part of the job here is to get the students to ask questions of each other. And it's such a great point. Every, everything that we're talking about here is something that the students need to be practicing too eventually. You know, so, so how do we get there? Yeah. I think that's a good point that you made, um, that we should encourage students, because sometimes I think students are afraid to challenge another, you know, their peers, um, because they don't want to be seen as confrontational and it could result in an argument. So I guess as instructors, we have to make them feel comfortable and tell them it's okay yeah. to, you know, ask questions. I think so. And then challenge your classmates as well. And you know, s too often questions have become a way of appearing to, you know, dis each other. Questions that can be honest desires to find out more, and I think we need to model that too. We're not questioning because we're doubting so much as we are questioning because we understand better, we aren't as clear as we could be, we need more evidence to, to be able to claim support. Um, huge, it's, it's just a huge issue for us to get our students to be doing this, and we have to start by modeling it. So we've talked about some of these linking extension kinds of questions, but here's an example right from our book. Is there any connection between what you just said and what Rajiv was saying a moment ago? Uh, how does your comment fit in with Mara's earlier comment? How does your observation relate to what the group concluded last week? Does your idea or challenge what others seem to be saying? So, okay, we're reminding the students in our own questions that you're not just an isolated person here, you're part of a community. You're part of a community that's got a developing point of view. How does what you're saying connected to what that community is saying? And to what extent can you show the connections and demonstrate them? And then how do we do that with each other in the class? How does that contribution add to what's already been said? Finally, we have summary or synthesis questions. Uh, again, we, we need to encourage our students to ask these of each other. What are the most important ideas that came out of this? What remains unresolved or contentious about this topic? What's still up in the air? What do you understand about it? How should we build on what we talked about this time in order to increase our understanding by by introducing a new topic or a new question next time. So these kinds of, I mean, another, one of my favorite summary or synthesis questions is, what question now do you have about this content? All right, we heard all of this. What, what questions are still unanswered for you? What would you want to understand better as a result of what you've heard? Go ahead. The beginning, I, I, li I like to think of dialogue almost as a kind of narrative where, where we, do, we do start with some very engaging idea or question or provocative statement. I'll sometimes want to say something that's outrageous for the students to disagree with. Then we'll use whatever the content is to unpack that and understand that better. Um, we'll, we'll have a process for working through it, maybe in small groups, come back to the large group. And in, the, and in the large group, we'll have our final synthesis statement. It is almost like a story. It is almost like a, a sequence of events that we've gone through to come to our, our final resting place. Yes? I mean, would it, would it help to ask 
Is there one thing that stands out from what we've done here today that, that you want to take with you? That really, that really gives you pause, I think, about, about how to end the class in a way that, that works for people. It, it does me, I should say. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in the past, I've had students who are waiting for those points, sort of at the end, before they take notes. Like, what are we getting out of this? Is this going to be on the test? I, I get that once in a while. And I know from my own experience, that stops me in my tracks because I feel almost insulted that they're, they're not getting it. You know, that I want this time to be a time where they can relax and think clearly and spontaneously and it's sort of like a gestalt moment for them and they just want to know what's going to be on the test and what notes do they have to take. And so, what is your, what is your response to that? I mean, one of my responses, which in some ways may not be helpful to what you just said, is rather than, rather than it be about something that we've said as instructors, what has a member of the group said that was helpful? So, so to, to put the onus on everyone else, the students in the class, what, what was said here that was helpful or memorable or interesting or you know, striking to you or whatever it might be, whatever the best way of capturing that so that it's not about what the instructor said. Um, I often will encourage students to, to think about what they said to each other. What did somebody say to you um, that was really helpful? Um, or, or maybe even helpful isn't the right word, but, but you know, that, that uh, may stick with you in some way. Then, now, I also will tell students that sometimes what's said here is something you're responsible for on the test. So don't think it's just what I say, it's what everybody says. And so you need to be, to the extent the tests are helpful here, um, you need to be you know, aware of all that is, is being processed and discussed and covered in here, not just what I'm covering. But again, put it, put it on the students, I think. Uh, other people, yeah, go ahead. I also think, you know, because students are worried about grades and is it going to be on the test and all that, it's important to have a I try to build into their grade, you know, this discussion point. So if tests are worth 40%, discussion is worth 20%, how do you, how do you grade that? Well, it, you know, you're, depending on the numbers in the class, if you've got 80 people, it might be more difficult. But if you've got 20 or 25, by the end of the semester, you, you know, they, they are participating. They're not allowed to just sit quietly. Yeah. So that's, they're being graded on their participation as well as the test. So it does, you know, by putting a grade on it, it's a terrible thing to say, it gives it more value to Yeah, them. I mean, it does validate it to a certain extent, <laughs> right? It's hard, it's hard to do and to do it well. But I think if we do give them, you know, just as we use rubrics for other things, I think we can give them a rubric about, and we've talked about them here, about some of the behaviors that we expect in productive conversation. And it is about listening and building on each other's comments and speaking clearly and having evidence to support your point of view, and et cetera, et cetera. Go ahead. That, you know, should, you already answered my question. Are you sure? In terms of uh, evaluating oh. okay. responses. Yeah. We, need to, we all need to get better at that. It's important. Okay, here are, um, we are quickly running out of time. In our book, we, we, we have something called conversational moves. And real, all it is is 
that there are lots of different ways to contribute to a conversation or to a discussion or to a dialogue. And I think we forget that it isn't just about making some, you know, incredibly transformative statement. It's about listening and it's about processing and it's, it's even about body language at, some, at times. So here, I'm just going to put these up here. I'm not going to read them. But here are some conversational moves that we've identified um, that we think add to make discussion more fruitful. And feel free to make comments at any time. I'm going to go to the next. Of course, that can be taken to extremes, but when, when I demonstrate it, I'll, I'll usually, you know, do it. It's all ready for, wow, I can't wait to hear your comment. Um, but I think we do, in more modest forms, I think we do use body language to show our enthusiasm and engagement. So this is just, just a few of the many, many possible ways to make a move in a conversation. Um, we don't really have time to do this, but I want, we mentioned circle of voices. Another wonderful technique that we found very powerful is what we call circular response. And this idea is building on circle of voices. Someone makes a comment. The next person has to build on the previous comment, has to use in some way the previous comment as a springboard for your own. And then the next person speaks and again has to use the most recent speaker's comment as a springboard for their own. It's a way of encouraging and practicing this whole idea that discussions at their best build, that the comments are bridges to one another and that they build on one another in important ways. So circular response is that way of building on one another's comments. Circle of voices is that talking stick idea that everyone gets to speak without interruption. Half full of quotes is a fun one. If you, if you have a reading that you've assigned, um, it's somewhat time consuming, but I've done it many times because it is fun. I will take quotes that I think are especially interesting. I'll cut them up into little pieces of paper. I'll put them in a hat. I'll pass the hat around and have people pick out the quotes. Their job is to read the quote and to make some comment about how it links to the reading that they did. And or some comment about why that quote might be meaningful to them. So you always give them a chance to look at their quote, to think about it a little bit, and then each person in some specified order gets a chance to talk about how that quote links up to the reading or to personal experience. Rotating stations, which is a somewhat complicated one, um, is using newsprint and having students respond to a question in groups. They're in groups of four or five, say, and they're rotating around a room. And you have different questions, and they respond to those questions as they rotate. They'll be at one question, they, they leave a comment. They'll go to another set of newsprint and leave a comment. And at the same time, other groups are coming by. And they're not just responding to the questions that have been made on the newsprint, they're also responding to the comments made by previous groups. So you have this crazy dynamic going of students responding in groups to the questions you've posed, but also responding to the many comments that previous groups have left on the newsprint as they come by. And they usually have about five minutes at each newsprint station. It can be. No question, yep. And that, and that is part of the idea, is to use the text or to use what they're supposed to have done for class and to build on that. 
Now, um, this, this is the last thing I've got a chance. I hardly have any time to talk about it, and it's, I'm embarrassed because it's so important. That's Stephen Brookfield who came up with the idea of the critical incident questionnaire. Our argument is, my argument is, that one of the best things you can do to improve the discussion in your class is to regularly administer anonymous surveys to students about how they feel about the class. Ask them when they're most engaged. Ask them when they're most distanced. Ask them when they're most surprised. Ask them when um, they met, felt most affirmed. Those kinds of questions you then receive, you compile the answers and then you report back in as much detail as you can without reading the, the comments how the students are experiencing the class. Then you say, based on these comments, here's a suggestion for how we can make the class even better for you. So let me, let me show you a little more. So we, we get regular feedback. It provides for more two-way communication. By the way, this assumes that you can't get the best possible feedback from students face-to-face. -face. Because of the power differences between instructors and students, they're not going to tell you all the time. And so you need an anonymous survey to get the best possible data about how the class is going. So here's an example of a critical incident questionnaire. At what moment in class were you most engaged? At what moment were you most distanced, affirmed, helped, puzzled, confused, surprised? Again, you get these answers. You compile with percentages or with, with fractions how students respond to them. It gives you a sense of how the class is going gives you tremendous feedback about how the class is going and how discussion is going. And then you give the feedback back to the class and say, um, we seem to have a few too many people dominating conversation according to the class, or we don't have enough participation in this class, or the discussion is wandering away from the, home, from the reading assignments that we've been doing, and we need to pay attention to those things. It, it could be any number of things that come up, but it's a way of taking the responsibility off you and saying, boy, I don't think people are participating enough. It's the class that's saying it. It's the class that's telling you and telling your class that we need more participation, that we need to be more disciplined, um, that we need to be careful about people who are dominating. And that sort of feedback, that sort of two-way interaction can have tremendously helpful effects on a class. I particularly recommend it for anyone who's concerned with tenure and promotion issues, with teaching, with critical incident questionnaires, you will again and again improve your teaching and how the students experience the class. They will feel better about the class. They'll feel like they're learning more. They feel like they're more invested. They feel like their opinions matter more. When you use, and it doesn't have to be this. My argument would be you need to do something, not just at the end of the class, to get a valuative feedback about how the class is going. And again, about how the discussion is going. Would you typically ask all those questions? Yes. We, we have asked all of them. Um, I have sometimes modified them. Um, Stephen Brookfield insists on asking them after every class. You know, I, I, I think he goes a little overboard there, but um, it works for him. I, I've been known to do it every third or fourth class, that kind of thing. But it's, it's amazing the feedback you get. And I will tell you something else. It's something that's going to be reassuring, too. When you feel like a class is go isn't going well, you can get some feedback to tell you there are more positive things happening than you realize. So it's both positive and it's constructive feedback for improving the class. Critical incident questionnaires. Some kind of an evaluation system that's anonymous for getting the feedback. Go ahead. And how long would you allot for that? Five to 10 minutes at the end of class. It does take some time. It's very important not to skip this part where you actually report to the class what you found. You really do want to invite their reactions. And if there are changes to be made, that you work together to make them. And let me, let me just say, I really should end here. Um, the four R's are about respect, about really caring about what our students think, really believing that what they have to contribute is valuable and important. 
relationships is about the powerful relationships that we were able to build up and develop through discussion, through conversation, through the sharing of stories, um, through the, the sharing of personal experience. Research refers to getting feedback from students about how the class is going. We're literally doing research on our class when we do these anonymous surveys or questionnaires to find out how they're experiencing the class. And the responsiveness says, we're not just going to teach the way we've always taught, we're going to teach in a way that is most helpful to this particular group of students at this particular time. So we're going to get whatever feedback we can, whatever data we can, to make this class as constructive and as useful and as powerful for the students as possible. So respect, relationships, research, responsiveness, the four hours. Thank you all very, very much for being such a fantastic uh, group and discussants for your many fine ideas about discussion. I know I'm taking away with me a few that I had not thought of, thanks to you, and um, I hope this was enjoyable and useful. So, thank you. Take care.